Welcome back to another episode of the Bigfoot Society podcast. This time I have the privilege of talking with Matt Pruitt, uh, all around awesome Bigfoot researcher guy. This guy is involved with everything over the last 20 years. He has been involved with finding Bigfoot, with BFRO. Uh, he's the editor and producer for Bigfoot and Beyond. He's involved with the NAWAC. This interview was a great time. Lots of really interesting information in here and a little bit uh, look behind the scenes uh, for Bigfoot and Beyond, which I really enjoyed as a uh, as a podcasting nerd. So uh, definitely sit back, relax, get something to uh, drink or eat, uh, whatever you'd like, and enjoy my interview with Matt Pruitt from All Things Bigfoot. All right. Well, thanks for coming back to the Bigfoot Society podcast. I have uh, the pleasure of talking to Mr. Matt Pruitt tonight. How's it going, Matt? Very good. How are you doing, Jeremiah? Doing well, doing well. So let's let's give our audience a little bit of uh, background here about uh, what we got going on with you, just so they know what they're in for tonight. So uh, we get, Matt Pruitt has been actively pursuing a resolution to the Bigfoot or Sasquatch conundrum for nearly two decades. Uh, he is an avid field researcher, public speaker, and has appeared on various media outlets and platforms to discuss the mystery ape phenomenon. Matt is also the producer of edit and editor of the popular podcast, one of my favorite ones, uh, Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo, such a good one, and the co-producer uh, and co-host of Apes Among Us, which is another great one, the official podcast of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, or NAWAC. So thank you so much for coming on, Matt. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, ask you right off the bat. So what is uh, Bigfoot to you? How much time do we have here? I know, uh, I know a lot of these questions. It's like, Oh yeah, you could go, man. It's changed a lot over the years. You know, uh, it's always been a pursuit and a passion. And I think it's something I've just had to come to grips with the fact that I've been like inexhaustibly insatiably curious about because it really has this year will be 20 years that I've since I started wow. pursuing it uh, roughly in 2002 okay and so you know you go through these phases you know in the beginning you know I was very skeptical I used to laugh when I would read Bigfoot related information and mm. then connected that to an experience I had and realized well maybe there's something there and then so you sort of transition from that could this possibly be real into encountering a lot of information, absorbing information, meeting witnesses and going through almost like a starry eyed, true believer sort of sure, a phase, yeah. you know, and then from that sort of transitioning into, you know, the highs and lows of pursuing this across the country for so long to getting cynical and vitriolic and just, you know, I took a break for about a year, maybe almost two years. Oh, wow. Um, well, I was still doing research. I just wasn't like I dropped off of everything, you know, and just okay. only communicating with a few people about it. And then sort of, uh, you know, re-engaged, reconnected with everything. Now a much more like optimistic contender. But, you know, I think mm. there's I, I've heard it said and I'm paraphrasing uh, like an old axiom or metaphor that like the the path to wisdom. And I'm not saying I'm wise. Okay. But, but there is a path to wisdom and I'm ho hopefully still on it. But the, you, first you go through naivety and then cynicism. And then eventually mm. you get out of that. And you're trending towards wisdom. So that's at least what I'm what I'm aiming at. So it's been everything from frustrating to exciting to maddening to, you know, exhausting. Yeah. So it's, oh, it's a lot of things. But what I'm convinced of is that, you know, well, obviously the phenomenon exists. And then the, the fundamental question is, well, what's responsible for the phenomenon? And for me, there's only two potential origins for that phenomenon. There's either some real external animal, like a species of animal that's responsible for the Bigfoot phenomenon or the Sasquatch phenomenon, or if there is no such species, it's all the production of the human mind. Yeah. And so I'm just convinced that that biological reality is the most parsimonious. It's the most likely of the two. And so that's the the hypothesis that I'm still testing is, is you know, is there an ape? that is responsible for the legend of Sasquatch, you know, the mythos. Gotcha. So you're thinking, you're thinking, and this, um, you're thinking there's an undiscovered, uh, well, to say North American wood ape, really, as the NAWACs. I mean, 
that's that's what I feel as well. But you know, I have all uh, all kinds on this show, which is fun to get the different viewpoints. But um, yeah, and you can definitely see that in places like uh, the Pacific Northwest, even in like the Wachita Mountains of Oklahoma. From what I've heard, I have never been there, of course, but um, it it just sounds like it's it's a wild, wild place for sure. Have you ever had any um, any encounters? Uh, with Bigfoot's or Bigfoot over the years, or I've had many experiences that were, I would say, like consistent with the Sasquatch phenomenon as okay. described by the. Okay. So I've never seen one, okay. so I, I don't have that like empirical. And the the experiences that I've had were extremely compelling. Hmm. Um, that you know I can't contextualize them any other way other than that, you know, the closest analogs that I can find in, let's say, some sort of narrative or testimonial form would be the claims of Sasquatch witnesses. It's very akin to what I've experienced in these places and everything from, you know, projectiles like rock throwing uh, in, in context that would rule out human aggressors, et cetera, uh, hearing characteristic vocalizations, you know, uh, other sound related things, but I've never had that clear sort of visual experience which is really frustrating after you know all these years because i spend a lot of the time in the field and have for you know hmm. I, just, I really started getting in the field about 2004 but it got really heavy from 2006 on okay and so and i spent a lot of time in the field in southern appalachia like north georgia hmm. western north carolina east tennessee sure uh, i lived in the pacific northwest for three years so that's okay. essentially all i did out there for three years you know oh, washington man. oregon some trips to northern california wow. and dc um, a lot in Oklahoma and Arkansas and then some various other states along the way. So believe me, it's very frustrating. Mm. Uh, but, you know, am I convinced that I've had encounters? Yes. But could I demonstrate that? No. And I haven't had that empirical observation, you know, that clear sighting in favorable, you know, lighting and visual conditions that would make me slam my fist on the table. It, yeah. And say, oh, gotcha. Yes, gotcha. You know. Oh, man. So. Oh, I've had quite a few episodes. And so I've talked to a lot of, of Bigfoot re researchers and the crazy thing, the thing I really like about you, Matt, is that you have so much uh, experience and you are, I mean, unless my eyes deceive me, you are a relatively young dude. Like I'm, but you're a pretty young guy, right? Like I'm guessing I, we're pretty similar. I'll let well, you guess a number that might be flattering. Right. Uh, no, I'll, I'll be 40 this year. Okay. We're um, very close. Cause I'll be 42 years. So, so I yeah. got, I got started young, a little, maybe younger than most people like, and when I was first networking with other researchers and all that, I was in my early twenties, you know? And okay. so it was, uh, it was an interesting thing, but, but yeah, uh, you know, I definitely had a lot of experience in the field and with other researchers, but again, not having that clear visual. And when I've interviewed, you know, so many people who have, mm. Yeah. You know, witnesses all over the country, but also other researchers that I that I trust and have faith in their testimony and their word. It is frustrating. It's a huge frustration, but uh, you, you've got to keep trying. So I stay you optimistic. Do it. And, oh, I try. Sure. Yeah, I try to treat every trip like maybe this will be the one, you know, yeah. but it hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. So what was the uh, what was the Bigfoot research field like in the early this is weird to say, but in the early 2000s, like, was it a different community than it is like in now in 2022 or like vastly different? OK, at first, you know, I, I did have an experience and I've talked about it in a lot of podcasts. And so, you know, maybe some of your listeners, they might have seen or, or heard another interview of mine. But I grew up in northeast Georgia in the southern Appalachians and had an experience in 1999. But again, it was sort of like a sound only experience. Mm. So it, I didn't really put it together and connect the dots between that and other claims related to Sasquatch experiences until about 2001. Um, and so when I started getting interested in essentially in the beginning, I was trying to validate my own experience like, well, you know, this happened to me in the North Georgia mountains. And mm. so if these things do exist, I can't be the only person, you know, who's experienced this, uh, et cetera. Oh, yeah. So it was a lot of trying to find local witnesses. And at that time, you know, the BFRO did exist, but there weren't many reports from the Southeast. And if I okay. recall, almost none. I don't think there were any from North Georgia or Northeast Georgia, West North Carolina. Most oh. of the time, you know, the people took reports close to where they were because those were the reports that they could go investigate. And so you had these these clusters of reports from Ohio and from the Pacific Northwest and these places where there were investigators. So all the witnesses that I met in those early years were all just through my own sort of outreach, 
you know, I grew up in a small town. It's a small okay. community. My dad was the local doctor in this small town. And so he oh, knew sure. everybody, you know, um, and I reached out to a lot of people on the internet trying to make connections and I didn't get any response for, you know, a couple of years, honestly. So there really wasn't much of a community. Um, I'm trying to recall when the Bigfoot forums came online. Okay. It was somewhere well, around okay, then. Yeah. It was somewhere in those early 2000s. It might have been prior to 2002, but I remember, you know, being a member of that forum and uh, reading a lot. But even then, I don't think that there were many people. There was, I think, one person in Georgia in general. Um, and I would emailed that person and never got a response or anything. So it certainly wasn't like it is today where there are so many people who openly talk about it mm -hmm. and, you know, so many people who are willing to communicate, share information, et cetera. It was like being, you know, a castaway on an island in the middle of nowhere for a long time. The first person that I met who was also pursuing this, that was in like 2005. Wow. Um, so for a few years, it was like, you know, me going out in the field was essentially, you know, hiking and camping in Southern Appalachia, looking for sign and then just begging my friends to join me. And of course they would go because oh, they man. loved the outdoors, but they yeah. weren't pursuing what I was pursuing. You know, they were willing to entertain me talking about it, you mm -hmm. know, but that was it. So it was a vastly different space for that. That's wild. So like really those first few years, it's, you don't have a lot of contact, uh, or there, were there certain books that you really like held on to during that time to kind of, uh, get the, the info in or. Uh... Yeah. Well, luckily for me, the first book I encountered and got really into was Grover Kranz's book. And, okay. you know, so I still think very highly of that book and think it's one of the, the few that's like required reading, you know, mm. um, but even of the books that existed, I'm trying to remember when Lauren Coleman's Bigfoot, uh, the true story of apes in America came out. Cause I think that was a little later, like maybe 2004, 2005. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, you're bought, right. yeah. I bought that when it was released. Cause I would follow Lauren's website. I think back then it was like the cryptozoologist.com or something like it. Maybe it was yeah. still Lauren Coleman.com, but, um, there was only a few websites, but even then in those books, there was hardly any talk about Sasquatch in, in the Southeast or in the Southern Appalachians. Mm. And, and in fact, the first, year or so of my investigation, let's say, not only trying to find local witnesses and meeting people and investigating their sightings and going to the places where their observations occurred. But I also dug pretty deeply into the historical archives of some current and then some like defunct print media outlets. Um, you know, you could do it. Some of those had been digitized. And so you could search those through certain systems or you could go uh, to these locations. And so I actually found 30 something reports within just the first year of digging that wow. predated the year 1900 of people describing seeing these things in Northeast Georgia, you know, just in the oh, few man. counties, like where I grew up in the counties surrounding it, there were a lot of these reports from the 1800s. And that really set the hook too, because then it was like, Oh, well, this is clearly not the product of the television or the radio or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a little bit older than that. And then you have, you know, obviously, the history of indigenous peoples, which the dominant indigenous people of that area would be the Cherokee. And there are some, you know, ape like characters represented in certain folklore tales, oral traditions, uh, myths, etc. So th there were things that sustained that along the way when I was looking for other people. Again, the, the witnesses that I met and found uh, the historical archive references, but yeah, it wasn't, it was a long time before I met like someone who was like actually a, a Sasquatch researcher to, you know, a, a, a large degree. You mm. know? That must've been amazing to like, all of a sudden you get, you slowly get into this community where you're like, Oh my goodness, there are people that, that think the same way with the same passion uh, about this, this mystery ape, which, and then, and then how does, how do we get from that to, to Matt Pruitt, where he's leading, organizing on almost 20 BFRO expeditions. He's involved with the NAWAC as a board member. He's involved with finding Bigfoot, finding Bigfoot episodes. Like, is that just a, a slow transition or like, when did you start to make those, uh, those crazy uh, connections with, with different people like that? Uh, again, I think that there's no real proxy for curiosity. And if yeah. you're if you're curious enough, you'll just keep chasing. You know, you're always foraging for information. And through mm. that, like you're making connections and making friendships because the people you're meeting, if they're 
insanely curious about the Sasquatch too. They're also foraging for information. So it's sort of like an exchange. There's a transaction of information that occurs. And so I had the story, I try to make a long story short. So there was another website that was uh, primarily looking at reports from uh, like Texas and Louisiana and some of those coastal regions. Okay. And there was a, a gentleman there who had posted a track that was part of a track line, but one particular track where it crossed a, a two track dirt road was fairly clear and talked about, you know, this family saw this thing cross their property and they, when they, they saw where it had crossed essentially came out the next day in the morning, once the sun had come up, you know, cause they saw it in the evening and this track was there and it was in North Georgia. And so I made contact with the gentleman through that forum. And it turned out that he was, uh, he was a, a paramedic, a former, uh, he'd gone through special forces school, but he wasn't like operational. Like, so he didn't, you know, he went on to get a degree in, I think, kinesiology and then became a, a paramedic. But he knew some people that were in sort of like this, this team of, let's say, like the, kind of a small crew of local Sasquatch researchers. Okay. Um, one of whom was in the BFRO. So once I had made mm -hmm. contact with him, he said, oh, you should come out camping with us sometime. And and I did, and we really hit it off. And so I got invited to come to a BFRO expedition in 2007 okay. and met Matt Moneymaker and a few other people. And um, on that expedition, Matt asked me if I would be an investigator. And of course, oh, I, wow. I just jumped at the yeah. opportunity because I knew that they, it, it, for a long time too, they had like the largest online billboard, so to speak, mm. for it, for getting reports, you know, soliciting and eliciting reports from from witnesses. You know, back then, if you Googled Bigfoot, that was the first result you got. And so interestingly enough, when I did join the BFRO, there were a backlog of North Georgia reports, a lot of which had just never been touched because there sure. were no real, you know, North Georgia investigators there. So it was just through that process that, you know, Matt uh, Moneymaker used to run all of the expeditions. And so he would travel across the country oh, wow. doing that. And after I'd been on two expeditions with him, he asked me if I would organize expeditions in Georgia. And so did ones in Georgia and that went well. And that expanded to doing expeditions in other parts of the country. And then I moved mm -hmm. to the Northwest and I was doing those there and then moved to Oklahoma and did Oklahoma and Arkansas and then back in the Southeast. And so it was through that process of like traveling, networking, meeting other people. Sure. Know, and when the Finding Bigfoot thing happened, it was interesting because there were two different pilots that were filmed, you know, like a, a pilot for a, a would be series that okay. were filmed um, with BFRO members. And I was in both of them, one of which we filmed in central Georgia. That must have been like 2009. And another of which we filmed on an island in the Puget Sound in Washington. It's like myself and Matt Moneymaker, Derek Randall's Wally Herson was there. That was a lot of fun. Oh, that um, would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. A few other people. And it was a great time. But when Finding Bigfoot finally happened, I remember they were sort of um, asking for information about given locations. And so I put together this sort of info packet on everything I had for North Georgia. Here's the best witnesses and best pieces of physical evidence or at least photographs of physical evidence. And um, that was one of the first episodes to get greenlit. And uh, it was actually the second episode that was filmed. So they filmed a pilot in Alaska earlier that year in or early actually in 2010. And then by 2011, the show got greenlit. So then they filmed an episode in the Uari National Forest in North Carolina. And then we filmed one in North Georgia. And it was really to Matt Moneymaker's credit and Cliff Berrickman's credit, because um, I met Cliff and Bobo about a year or two prior that, uh, you know, I'd provided all this information. And I'd grown up there. And mm -hmm. so when it got greenlit, you know, Cliff and, and Matt Moneymaker pushed the production company and said, you should hire this guy because yeah, totally. he knows everyone. He knows where all these locations are, you know. So they gave me a job as the field coordinator and fixer for that episode. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was great. So, it was, you know, part of that like advanced production team that lines up, you know, everything from like rental cabins to rental cars to getting all the permits for all the places that we need to film and scheduling what's going to be filmed, what day, where and lining up witnesses to be at these different places and times. And it was a blast. You know, each one of those is a, for the production side is a, is a two week gig. So there's a week of advanced production and then we're filming with the cast for a week. Okay. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was very stressful. I'm sure you've heard Cliff and Bobo talk about that first season because it would be wheels up at like 8 AM and it would get done filming at like 4 30 AM. And it was that way every day. You know, yeah. Just super long days. And I remember after that first one, I was like, Oh man, I don't know if I want to do that again because I'm just, you know, a, a, I'm a Sasquatch researcher, you know, I'm yeah. not like a TV production guy. Sure. And some time passed. And by the time they were about to film season three, 
uh, you know, I was living in central Oklahoma and there was a lot of great information there. And they said, would you want to do another one? And I was like, yeah, sure. And once that one was done, it was a lot of the same pressures and going, oh man, I don't know if I want to do another one of those again, but they were both great fun. Cause you know, oh, I, I was very close with all those cast members. And so they were a blast to be around. So through that, it just, those connections still, you know, maintained and blossomed, et cetera. You know, I did eventually uh, resign from the BFRO. It was mostly just like, I wasn't interested in Okay. interviewing witnesses, publishing reports or doing public expeditions anymore. But I still have sure. a lot of great friends in that organization. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was always interested in what the North American Wood Ape Conservancy was doing. I had met a couple of their members years prior, and then uh, they had eventually talked about potentially expanding into other areas outside of the U.S. interior highlands, like outside of the Washita's. And so I applied in 2016 and joined and and was invited to go to Area X by Daryl Collier. And I was just amazed. I mean, it, mm. I, I genuinely strongly believe that what they're doing is the strongest effort that's ever been made in the history of this subject to conclusively resolve yeah. this mystery. And so, yeah, uh, you know, I've been there, I guess now for almost six years and have loved every minute of it and, and eat that up. But yeah, with the podcast too, I mean, I just Cliff and Bobo and I spend a lot of time together and Cliff's like a brother to me. He's one of my closest friends. And so That's awesome. yeah. I, I had a background recording and playing music and still did a lot of that just, you know, at home or projects for other people. And so when they said, Hey, we want to do a podcast, do you want to produce it and edit? It, it was like, yeah, sure. So yeah, dude. It, here we are. We did 1.8 million downloads last year, which I think is it's pretty great. So, uh, Snap. oh my goodness, very oh. proud, of, very proud oh. of those guys. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I do all the jingles million. and the music and everything. So that's a lot of fun. You know? Okay. Can I, can I ask you that REM style intro that you guys have now, you know, like the song mm -hmm. that is amazing. I love that's that song. That's all me. It's funny because I that's was trying, you. I was trying to go for a no. Clean, it, it is you though. Now that yeah. I think about it, it's you. I was trying to go for like Weezer meets Queen. Okay. I actually have about five intro songs. Uh, oh I need goodness. to finish the it's other ones because so I want to rotate them. I have I'm, listened to that song on repeat. And then I'm the, the sadly enough, but gather around it's Bobo's story time. <laughs> that's that's you too. That's my best uh, fake classic country hank williams wannabe oh my par goodness. parody voice and i do the bobos the dude for sure in that song so so oh, it's this a, is great info i always wondered like if that was bobo or like what was the deal it's no, it's no. phenomenal well it's fun to do that <laughs> stuff you know so we're doing i actually we, we're talking about doing uh more like recurring segments like that so i've got a few other yeah. jing jingles in the works but yeah that podcast is a lot of fun you know it's a big commitment because we do it every week and yeah, I think you're telling me, I think we're at like 140 something episodes now. And, yep. and so it's, yep. it's a lot of fun. So and, good. Uh, I'm glad people enjoy it. It makes me super happy every time. I appreciate it. I know a lot of people appreciate it. And like you've, you've even, uh, helped the podcast go off in, uh, what was it? The Ohio Bigfoot conference. There was a live episode mm -hmm. and you were there kind of doing your thing, right? Making sure it all went off without a hitch. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I that there. one. Was, I heard about it. But. That one and Cryptid Con, we did two different live ones, oh, and they yeah, both yeah. the audio. You know, I wish the audio was cleaner for the listeners. In both of those situations, mm. we couldn't get a direct line out of like the the oh, soundboard. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there was a you know we had to use some some creative sort of uh, combinations of things that probably shouldn't have been combined in order to get those scratchy okay, rough yep, signal that yep. we got. But I love the content of both of those. What's funny because when That's we good. did. The, we did that live Ohio thing. Like I had to use essentially like two blue Yeti mics and just get the whole room and oh, Cliff and Bobo yeah, okay. near it, you know, yeah. which is unfortunate. I wanted to get the, like that direct signal, but so the whole time I had headphones on and I was just watching all the signals and trying to make sure that, mm. cause the audience was asking questions and was like, yeah. we got to make sure we can hear them. You yep. Know? Oh man. So I wasn't really like listening. I was more, you know, watching these signals. And so when I got home to edit that, when I was like, damn, this was really good. You know, like it's the, good. Bobo's one liners in that one, like he had a lot of zingers and I was like, Oh, Bobo was like on fire that night. I was sitting right next to him, but I, I didn't hear him. You know what I mean? Right. No, it was good. And, um, I, I'll, I'll re reel back the fanboy in a few minutes, but I got, I'm going to go on for a few more minutes. Um, I would say favorite Bigfoot and beyond episode is, uh, the Bob Saget one. Uh, when you talked about strange Day, because you're in it too, it is a solid episode and it's a really cool look at, um, I think a time where not many people 
well, like a lot of people were involved with that episode. And I'm just going to say, we're not going to talk about it here because I want you to go listen to Bigfoot and beyond. It is a stellar episode. Um, can you give maybe a behind the scenes look into like, what's your, what's the workflow of like preparing a Bigfoot and beyond uh, episode? Well, usually Cliff and Bobo book the guests, okay. you know? And so sometimes that can be booked in advance, but usually it's just, you know, they've got a long list of friends and contacts and, and let's see who's available that we haven't had yet. Or what's, mm. if there's something topical that occurred, you know, I kind of see my role as a producer and, you know, I played music in a major label recording band back in the oh, day. Okay. So I worked with like record producers, you know, and it understood sort of like the, the nature of their job, so to speak. And so I tried to bring that to some degree to the podcast. So the way that we treat it essentially is, you know, it's, it's a pretty big free for all on the recording side. Um, because I want everyone to feel, I don't want anyone to ever get red light fever. Um, and you know, that doesn't always apply to Cliff and Bobo because they've done TV and speaking gigs for so long, but sometimes guests get nervous. So that alleviates right. all the pressure. So essentially, you know, it is edited. So we, we usually record for an hour and a half or two hours to arrive at an hour to hour and 15 minute okay. episode. And sure. then that way, if people want to stop and think about their responses, they don't feel that radio silence, you know what I mean? And, and if they say a lot of ums and ahs and things, I can that's, remove that's those. That's really smart. Yeah. You know, it, but yeah. that's the beauty of audio only is that like some of these episodes have hundreds of micro that's edits true. in them because you can't see the jump cuts. Right. Because yeah, it's audio yeah, yeah, only. Yeah, right. So, But, you know, for, for me, it's like I, I want everyone's like just talk and be as comfortable as you can say whatever you want. And then, you know, on the back end, we'll we'll polish it and tighten it and make it into, you know, sure. a really tight, concise conversation and. I think we've got a good flow of that, Wow, you know, so it, it takes a, it's a little longer because, you know, I'm on all the calls. And so it's usually like an hour and a half call. And then we do that multi-track. So then I fly in all the tracks and mix and, okay. and EQ and compress each one individually, cut out all the background noise in certain tracks, print that. And, you know, once those are mixed, print that into a stereo pair and then edit that wow. stereo pair for content, which usually takes another, you know, couple of hours and then print that and then insert the songs and the ad breaks and all that kind of stuff. So that is phenomenal. But you hopefully, you know, know, it's like, it's like just the best of the best, you know, of, it is of all yeah. those conversations because again, Cliff and Bobo are always on fire, but we don't want guests to ever feel like they're under pressure to have to, you know, if they want to stop and pause or if they you know, like, we were at my secret spot up at like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. It's like, hey, I can edit that out, you know. Oh, I, I know I know what you're talking about because yeah. I've had those edits in my show. Certainly. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's it. a lot of fun, you know. Oh, it's so good. It's, well, the editing is is phenomenal. Uh, you would never know that there's hundreds of edits done per episode. It's it's done really solid. So bravo on that. Um Back to the back to the Bigfoot. That was me nerding out for a little bit. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I found that you led a Sasquatch tracking course back in the day. Yeah, through those same individuals that I had met, uh, those first individuals in Georgia that had found that track and posted it on that forum, they were all heavily into um, the step by step method of you know man tracking, essentially, which okay. is used. I wouldn't necessarily call it like a search and rescue technique because it's more of a documentation uh, technique. And so sort of a, there were a lot of pioneers of that style and people who rose to prominence teaching it and writing about it. Like one of the best books in that regard is called The Fundamentals of Man Tracking by a guy named uh, Ab Taylor or Ab okay. Cooper. Ab Taylor, I think. Okay. It's been a while. Um, but uh, probably one of the most renowned people in that sort of skill set was a border patrol uh agent named joel harden joel mm. you listeners might recognize him he was the guy that came in and was the first to really poo poo freeman's tracks in 1982 in the blue mountains oh, he was the one okay. that, you know when, all right all right in Krantz's book that he's sort of battling against when he's describing you know the reasons that freeman's trackway in the ground was dismissed in 82 you know the the points that Krantz is rebutting are joel harden's points interesting so meeting these guys and what, what happens in a lot of those cases, too, is like subsequent to like if a crime occurs or if something did happen to a person, they would bring in a tracker to evaluate all the sign. And then that person might testify at a trial or something like that. So the step by step method, I guess it can be done fairly quickly, like if you are trying to find a missing person or if you're trying to apprehend a criminal, which is a lot of what Joel Harden was trying to do in Border Patrol with search and rescue and with, you know, trying to find people who were like fugitives, let's say. Um, so 
I took Joel Harden's course in 2007. It's the Joel Harden School of Professional Trackers. And they taught a course yeah. up in Appomattox, Virginia. And at the, the insistence of my friends who had taken these sorts of courses multiple times, they said, you got to do this one. And it's Joel Harden. He's like the most legendary tracker ever. You should go do it. Hmm. And it was it was great. Again, it was 2007. It was before I joined the BFRO. But um, my friends, they were all older than me. They were all in their, their 40s. Oh, I was sure. in my okay. 20s. Right. And so they were like, I was forbidden to talk about Sasquatch. They were like, you are not <laughs> going to bring up Sasquatch. You're not going to embarrass us, you know. <laughs> so it was interesting because I remember we there was I'm trying to think about how many people were in this class, probably somewhere around like 30 to 40 um, from memory. There's a picture of it up on my blog, if that thing's still up. But uh, yeah, we're in this room and like there's this big long table. It was at a 4-H camp in Appomattox, Virginia that they had rented. And uh, they went around the room talking to people and it was like all these professional search and rescue guys and a lot of law okay. enforcement. And then it got yep. to me, you know, and I was like, what yeah. do I say? You know, it, oh, just really interested in learning tracking, you know, like because all these guys were <laughs> these guys were all badasses who were saving people's right. lives. And exactly. I was like, this Bigfoot dork who wanted to learn tracking. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to Joel about the uh, the Bigfoot thing and the Paul Freeman case and all that. But oh, man. so after we took that course, um, my friend is a gentleman back uh, that I was associated with back then named Lee Culver thought, well, you know, we could have a course that's like this for Sasquatch researchers. Sure. Right? Incorporate, incorporate a lot of the information that, you know, Grover Krantz's sort of um, interpretations about foot morphology or, you know, his inferred foot morphology and a lot of Jeff Meldrum's interpretations about that. So it would be like a primer to Sasquatch field researchers about these sorts of like the the essential elements of man tracking and how to document tracks in this sort of as forensic a way as possible or something that would mm. really that the kind of documentation that would hold up and then also incorporate everything that we think we know about the sasquatch foot and how it functions and a lot of examples of sasquatch tracks from the the data set etc so we did one of those in north georgia for the georgia bfro at the time okay and then we did another one in uh, 2009 in utah that was a great trip we, wow. with the the Utah chapter, the, the BFR, we were out there on the Duchesne river for a few days in a gorgeous, amazing place in the yeah. Uintas there. So it's something I would, I would love to get back into. I'm not super talented at it. It really is an art. I mean, being on those teams and learning from those trackers was just mind blowing the things that they would see, you know, and I'm sure it's just something through time and repetition. Like, you know, I've, I've played music and recorded music for so long. Like I can hear a song and be like, Oh, that's an 18 inch kick drum. And that's a Stratocaster on the second position or on the fourth position, or those are humbuckers. That sounds like a Les Paul, you know, and yeah. where the other people would go, huh? And that's how those trackers were looking at stuff on the ground. You know, that's they wild. could, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, these little micro sign almost that it's like, how, you know, what the hell? But it was, it's a fascinating sort of, uh, art let's say uh, or oh, yeah. you know it's an art and a skill but for me it's so it's not abstract but it's far enough out of my reach that it might as well be abstract so it's more art than skill for me you know i'm still That's fascinated wild. by it but let's say we could uh let's pretend we're talking to a listener who's like i'm gonna go out i'm gonna look for bigfoot tracks what's some advice you could give to that listener that'd be really like solid takeaways of like what they need to look for or what they might not want to do that they would do, do by accident you know things like that anything that you could well i i think a lot of it has to do with defining your expectations mm -hmm. you know it's like well what do you what do you why do you want to find tracks so if you're looking for tracks because you want to document something definitive okay for the um to be to be proffered for the approval of other people well now you're up for a really difficult task you okay. know because you could say, well, let's look at, I mean, I've got a number of casts here. They're all replica casts. Yeah. You know, that's, I have, uh, I don't know how many pounds of dental stone and plaster for casting tracks that has been in my kit with me everywhere I've gone since like 2005. That's how many tracks I've cast wow, okay. zero, you know, but it's <laughs> wow, still there. Yeah. I still take it with yeah. me. I have seen what I think were legitimate tracks in okay. the field on a handful of occasions, but they certainly weren't of the resolution or clarity that would be convincing. So again, if you take like the most detailed, best tracks that, mm -hmm. that we're aware of, you know, and you realize like, you know, there's degrees of quality and these are the highest quality ones documented yet. 
And yet they haven't done anything really to move the needle towards definitive proof that anything of equal clarity or quality, let's say, or mm -hmm. lesser certainly won't have that impact. So, you know, if you were looking to document tracks in order to sort of sway or to, to gain some kind of acceptance, whether that's scientific or academic acceptance, you know, the bar is pretty high. Okay. Now, if you're just trying to verify, validate that there are Sasquatches in the area that you're interested in looking into, then certainly that's where it gets tricky, though, because there is ambiguity in animal tracks. You know, the um, a Appalachia is a good example. You know, um, Area X and the Washita's is a great example. I mean, that's an incredibly, that's the rockiest place I've been, you know, easily east of the Rockies, but one of the rockiest places I've ever been. So there's very few okay. places that would even retain a track, you know. Hmm. So the place is loaded with bears and we've seen bears with our own eyes and gotten lots of pictures of them on camera. But it's very rare that you would find a bear track of the kind of quality that you could photograph or cast and that anybody would go, man, that's a bear track. Everything else would be like a roughly bear paw shaped divot, you know. So right. any animal can have tracks to that degree. The Sasquatch is no different. So I think that's the the difficult thing is that there's also this sort of um, frequency illusion that happens, you know, hmm. where let's say if you got a new... I don't know, pick a car out of a hat, a, a, a Jeep Cherokee, you know, nice. all of a, all of a sudden you notice every You're gonna see Jeep Cherokee yeah. on, I, okay. you know, on, okay. on the yep. interstate and in yep. the, the grocery store parking lot and the mall it or wherever nice you go. That's a Jeep Cherokee. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you might think to yourself, wow, there's really, you know, all of a sudden these are everywhere. You know, it's like right. well, they were always there, but you weren't looking. Well, when you exactly. start looking for, you know, a roughly foot shaped divot in the ground, you're going to find them everywhere. Because, you know, such is the substrate of most of North America. And so I think that's where a lot of people run into to problems as well. So I, I would say if I was prompting someone, like, here's what you should look for, you know, it, if you could find, you know, one or more tracks, at least one, you know, whether it's a clear track or whatever it is that you think is a track, and you could sort of suss out to the best of your ability mm -hmm. you know which end would represent the heel and which end would represent the ball or where the toes of the foot are sure. right well the the next track has to be somewhere within reason from that you know okay and so you know a lot of people will use let's say a tracking stick it's a lot easier to, to do on humans than the hypothetical sasquatch because the human step length is shorter but essentially if you have a long enough stick a tracking stick basically you have two rubber o-rings I wish okay. I had like a representation of it. So you'd have like two rubber O-rings on, let's say, a six foot long stick. And if mm. I find your footprint, let's say, um, I wish I had something to, to demonstrate this with. But essentially, I would lay the tracking stick down on your footprint okay. and roll one O-ring down. Well, especially it works better if like, let's say, if I can see both your feet. Makes okay. sense. Yeah. I put, I put the bottom of the stick at your back heel. And then where your front heel strikes, I roll up one of those rubber O-rings there and then potentially the other rubber O-ring to your toe. Gotcha. And so that now then I can take the stick to your front foot and somewhere where those O-rings are, there oh, should okay. be the That's next cool. track. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. of course, there'll be variation if you run or if you yeah. slow down, like those step lengths will change. But, you know, if you're seeing just one divot in the ground and you cannot find a subsequent, you know, impression, then that's probably not a footprint because these things if they exist, certainly obey the laws of physics and therefore would leave multiple tracks. And so that's a good way to, you know, talk yourself out of proclaiming yeah. that something's a Sasquatch track when it's not. And I, I see a lot of those online. One thing that's odd to me is that for whatever reason, anything that's roughly foot shaped, people will assume is a track, including like a void of a void of grass. Yeah. You know, you have a grassy area and then there's sort of a grassless brown roughly like you know rectangular and they'll be like there's the track and i'm like well did the sasquatch foot just like, rip i don't know <laughs> is it like a velcro <laughs> foot that just tears all the grass out with it and so like yeah, the grass right. is everywhere but some for some reason when it stepped there just removed the entire top layer of grass you know that's so funny. yeah dude it, but it's a pitfall right i mean it's the same thing you know i don't put any stock into stick structures I've never okay. seen any any structures that I thought had to have made. Well, I take that back. The one structure I've seen that I knew had to be made by hand, we did figure out that it was one of the property owners who was making it, you know. Oh, really? Specifically wow. trying to okay. get the other property, the other person that lived on the property invested. 
um, emotionally, you know, invested in this thing. So, oh, no but, way. Oh, but man. that frequency wow. illusion, if you go out looking for what you deem to be patterns, you mm -hmm. will find them everywhere. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, and you can go to a city park, you know, a, a municipal park in a city limits where there's not a single animal bigger, bigger than a squirrel. And you will find those same, you know, breaks and twists or not twists, but like, uh, you know, X formations, oh, assemblages, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. You know? And um, I mean, I. I've been to a summer camp before uh, as a uh, junior hire and they would have an outdoor skills week and they would have the kids make stick structures and they were so good that it would have fooled some, some uh, Bigfoot researchers, but you know uh, it is what it is. Everyone's got their kind of different view uh, of things, but um, I'm curious looking back on 20 years, what has it been like to see that, technology in itself progress and see different ways uh technology has started to been uh being used in bigfoot field research i don't feel like a whole lot has changed even though okay. there's a lot more technology um you know i mean we were using thermal imagers back in like 2006 and 2007 um i know some researchers were using them prior to that you know they've gotten a lot less expensive which is tremendous you know that's amazing mm -hmm. Um, that's a huge thing, but I, I do think that there's probably an edge that technology will have, but at the same time, it's like, well, you could have the nicest fishing tackle that money can buy and still right. not know where the trout are, you know, that's true. you know, you wouldn't know which, which holes to fish, so to speak. So I think, I don't know that we'll ever have a full technological, like proxy for the need of the human element. So, you know, in the NAWAC, we've been putting a lot more, uh, energy and resources and interest into trying to get images, you know, okay. so we have invested in a really intricate and, uh, you know, I'm very optimistic about it, a, a camera array camera, like a game camera, oh, still camera great. array, yeah. but you still need the human element to some degree. So we still, you know, are down there with cameras, et cetera, because, you know, everything has a cost and a benefit. So, you know, a camera, it's not going to get cold True. and it's not going to get bored and it's not going to fall asleep and it's not going, you know, all the things that a human could do if they're sitting in a blind for hours. But at the same time, you know, a camera, if it hears a twig pop, can't look over its shoulder and point its attention in another direction. So I think it takes right. both, but you do have to be in the right place and at the right time. Like there's just no substitute for luck when it comes to, you know, this or any other animal that, it's in that same category of, you know, if the Sasquatch exists, then obviously they must have very large home ranges and they must be very mobile in those home ranges. And mm. just like Siberian tigers or wolverines in North America or also Siberia, there's wolverines in Asia there. Um, you know, you might be within a home range, you know, a, a Siberian tiger males home range is about 1500 square kilometers. Sure. So if someone said, I guarantee you, I can get you in the home range, you'd think, oh, great. But, you know, you're in 1500 square. You might sit in the same place for five years and never it might never walk by that spot, you know. So the technology helps. You still have to have the good information coming in on the front end. And in lieu of that, or even if you do have all the best information on the front, you're still there's always going to be a certain reliance on serendipity or luck, you know. Oh, yeah. No, I, I agree. Well, it's. I mean, there's so, if you think of Bigfoot history, there's so many examples of like what it comes down to is they're just lucky dudes that just happened to like, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I'm curious. Uh, well, we kind of we kind of skirted around the issue earlier, but I like to ask this to every every guest. Are there are there kind of could you maybe give a few recommended um uh, books for a, a Bigfoot researcher or like an aspiring one to have on their bookshelf. Absolutely. To me, the, the required reading, like the essential ones, uh, Ivan T. Sanderson's Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life, I think okay. is, is an incredible book. Um, the, you know, some of it's, there's some antiquated stuff in there just because it was published in 61. You know, he was writing it through the late fifties and aggregating mm. information and then published it in 61. So a lot of discoveries have happened in the interim, you know, other fossil apes and we know much more about the living apes too uh, but it's still uh, you know it's a tremendous work uh john green's the apes sasquatch the apes among us you know is is a classic in terms of books that were written by scholars or you know scholarly books academics etc Crance's book i think is one of the best 
uh, Meldrum's Sasquatch Legend Meet Science. And genuinely, yeah. I, I think Bender Nagel's The Discovery of the Sasquatch is one of the, you know, up, okay. utmost best. Yeah. I think that's an incredible book. There's a lot of other ones. I mean, I've got a huge, huge library of Sasquatch or and books related to other mystery apes, too. And then a lot of like uh, books from relevant disciplines, you know, physical anthropology, evolutionary biology, ecology, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that Bender Nagel book, I think, would be, you know, if I had to recommend one to someone to start, it would be that one because it's sort of a great overview of the subject as a whole. And it also addresses so many of those answers. Of, well, if such animals do exist, why haven't we acknowledged it or recognized it? And he paints a beautiful case. You know, he, mm. he mounts a strong argument for for that. But, man, there are so many other good books that are that see the subject from from different angles and various angles there that you know i, I eventually will compile a list of all my favorites and put it up on my website there because there's so be many awesome. that yeah you know, i'm constantly reading and and you know there's nothing more exciting for me than when like i find something new and devour it and get into it i also tell people too like there's a, a number of those books that i reread every year just year oh after, really and okay have for that like 20 years almost oh you know? wow and people will say like, oh, well, you know, you, the, the book doesn't change. And it's like, yeah, but you do, you know, oh, yes. you That's change a good every point. year. That's and a good so, point. You know, there are things so many times that, you know, I've, I've you, you cross over these lines and you're trying to absorb them. But then somewhere down the road, you meet a witness or you have an experience yourself or, you know, you meet another researcher who provides an insight. And, you know, it sort of like changes a little bit or you go to these other locations and then you reread that same passage a year later and suddenly it connects in a different way. You see things in it mm. that you couldn't see before because you didn't have some like real world context to place that in. And so a lot of those things I do recommend like reading over and over again. It's the same with, you know, anything that like I'm sure, you know, we've all had movies right that we loved when we were young right. and that you watch them again as an adult you know some movie that you loved as a kid that you thought was fun and then you watch it as an adult and you're like man this is kind of heavy like there's some real adult dude moving powerful sure. things in this but you couldn't see it as a kid so again the movie didn't change but you did right and i think those books provide a lot of i can't tell you too how many times um some some pattern will emerge from the data to me that I've never heard someone talk about explicitly. And I'll mm. be like, I've found something, you know, I've discovered something new, you know, and then I'll go reread Sanderson. And I'm like, oh, he, he, he was about on it. it. Yeah. In 1961, yeah. he yeah. picked up on this same trend that other people haven't even talked about since then. And so there is a lot of I think if you read those five books, Sanderson, Green, Meldrum, Krantz, Bindernagel as yep. a starter, like that's a pretty solid education on the subject as a whole. And then you can expand out a lot from there. Nice. Nice. That that's, that's good advice. Um, is there anything currently, so you're researching all the time, you're reading all the time. Is there anything right now that has you super excited, uh, in the field of Bigfoot, something that maybe you've just found or something like that? Um, I think one of the most recent things, you know, beyond what the North American Wood Ape Conservancy is doing, you know, which I'm incredibly intensely passionate and excited about and Definitely. ready for ready to get back out there this year. Um, Gareth Patterson's, you know, uh, mm. Beyond the Secret Elephants, uh, you know, I interviewed him in March of 2020 and we published that on Apes Among Us. And that to me was really a striking sort of uh, revelation, so to speak, in that. You know, you have these certain forms of mystery apes, like Sanderson sort of categorized these four types, you know, the Neo Giants, which are the big, large, bulky Sasquatch, you know, seven and a half foot tall, disproportionately long arms, no neck, broad shoulders, the mm. man like forms, you know, which Sanderson called the subhumans, like the Almas, the Almasti, uh, the Barmanu, sure. uh, et cetera. And then down through the, you know, what he called the proto pygmies, you know, the small orang pindek, ibu gogo, et cetera. And then uh, the subhominins, which were like the quadrupedal, more ape-like mystery apes. And, you know, not, not a lot had come out of Africa and certainly nothing like the wood ape or Sasquatch, you know, again, Sanderson's neo-giant terminology. And for all intents and purposes, that's what Gareth is sort of describing. You know, he's seen individuals of, of that size. And so given his background, I don't know if you've read his book or listened to the interview. I have not. No, but I yeah. definitely need to, because he keeps 
coming up more and more. I definitely need to just check him out. Definitely. Yeah. I interviewed him at length on apes among us so that you can find that one from 2020. Okay. And then he was on cliff and Bobo's podcast afterwards. And I think he did Alex's. He YouTube did. Yeah. Show I believe recently. he did. Yep. Yep. But you know, he's got an incredible reputation and career in a body of work in mm. terms of, you know, wildlife research and, and essentially, I don't want to say single-handedly because he did have help, but he sort of spearheaded the rediscovery of an entire population of elephants that was thought to be. Yes, I don't think it's a giant population. I think it's a few dozen individuals, but nonetheless, they're elephants in an area where it was thought that they were down to just one surviving individual. And through his field work, he discovered that there were that's awesome. There was a surviving population, and so he wrote about that and he pursued that for like twenty years and. Wow. Then he came out of the proverbial, you know, closet, so to speak, and said, oh, by the way, over these 20 years, I saw these bipedal hair covered seven to seven and a half foot tall. Wow. Peaked conical head, no neck, giant shoulder having bipedal apes in this part of the, the tip of South Africa there in like yep. the Afro Montane forest. And so someone of his caliber making those claims and then aggregating a lot of information. I think that's huge because it seems like that will be more readily, you know, part of the, the reason that people are hung up on the Sasquatch mystery is that, you know, that the, there are not historically or represented in prehistorically in the fossil record, a precedent for large apes in North America. Hmm. But you can't make that argument in Africa, you know, which is the, the sort of the, the cradle of, of hominids and hominin. Um, you know, where we radiated out from and all of our relatives and ancestors, et cetera. So you would think that if there was anywhere that anthropologists would be more sympathetic to the idea of surviving hominids, sure. it would be in Africa, yeah. especially South Africa, where, you know, Australopithecines were, et cetera. So that I think is really exciting. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things that Doug Highcheck is talking about doing are very oh, exciting. Yeah, dude, in, totally. In terms of testing yeah. and, and things of that nature. Um, I would say those would be the, the big two that come to mind beyond, you know, what the North American Wood Ape Conservancy is doing and, and, you know, what we're trying to accomplish for sure. Mm, that's awesome. Oh man. This has been a very enlightening and uh, fun interview. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. Um, are there uh, ways that people can uh, keep up to date with uh, what you're doing? If you have a, a presence, uh, online at all, uh, things of that nature. I was kind of sort of, I I'm on Twitter at improve at Bigfoot, but I yep. probably only tweet like five times a year. I'm pretty bad at it. Um, and then I, I do have uh Matt Pruitt online.com where people can click the contact. You know, I had to have some kind of like web presence. Oh, totally. Yeah. Never had one. Um, but I think primarily, you know, you'd follow updates at woodape.org for the North American wood ape conservancy. And then our podcast apes among us we've got a, a one episode that's in the can that'll be coming up soon oh sweet and then another one that segments of it are recorded but uh, other segments need to be finished and in, in producing that one so th we should have a couple out very soon but so yeah woodape.org or you can find me at mattpruittonline.com and there's a contact form and all that but yeah i don't really do social media i avoid facebook like the plague i only only log into facebook to uh update cliff and bobo's podcast page <laughs> okay um, so a lot of people are like you forgot my birthday and i'm like where would i have seen it it was on facebook oh i'm sorry i don't oh, well there you go my bad so <laughs> I, I miss birthday notifications but i don't i don't miss all the nonsense so yeah exactly there's too much of it on there but all right well thanks so much for for coming on matt and uh everyone Go subscribe to uh, to that that podcast. It's a good one. So thank you. Thanks so much, man. Very glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. You got it. Thanks for listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast. Please take a few minutes to review the show on iTunes. Five stars as it does help us get into the eyes and ears of more listeners on iTunes. Uh, that will help us just get bigger and bigger and get even better quality guests for future shows. Uh, also, if you have any Bigfoot encounters or cryptid encounters, please send your stories and uh, audio and photos, whatever you've got, over to BigfootSociety at gmail.com. 
If you'd like to become more involved with Bigfoot Society and get some extra content, we do have a Patreon uh, where you can get all sorts of cool things. For example, for $7 a month, you get extra Bigfoot Society content, uh, usually interviews, but other things as well. You get a sweet membership card and a vinyl sticker that I send to you in the mail. You get access to the Bigfoot Society after show, which is an extra interview after the main interview with the weekly guest. And usually they are up for uh, Patreon members to be in that extra show segment with them and me. And you get to ask your uh, question live to them and get an answer from the guest, which as you've seen what guest we've had in the past, this could be a really big deal. There's also a private discord where you can get involved with uh, talking to me one-on-one and the community there. And that's always a great time. Uh, also this year we're partnering with different artists to make exclusive quarterly Bigfoot society mark merch. If you stay in the particular patreon tier for three months and you get a special merch item sent to you in the mail after that three month period uh, this quarter we're partnering with liz pavlovic from keep on creeping on which is a great design and if you join uh, you can join the sticker tier for 15 dollars monthly uh, the shirt tier for 25 dollars monthly and the tote bag tier for 30 dollars monthly uh, those different tiers also get all the uh, different things that were mentioned in the first tier uh, which is the seven dollar a month tier now you have until the last week of january to join the 15 25 or 30 dollar tier as the design will change uh, next quarter so if you want to get that keep on creeping on bigfoot society collab t-shirt or sticker or tote bag you don't have much time to join the bigfoot society patreon uh, you have until the uh I believe the second to last day of January to do it. So do that quick. You can find the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Uh, we're very thankful for all our supporters that we have in so many different ways and appreciate uh, all our listeners coming back week after week to listen to more cryptozoology based interviews. Uh, thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Bigfoot Society. Any content provided by our guests are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone. Thank you.